Historically, Christmas Eve candlelight service symbolizes Christ coming into the world. And in more liturgical churches where the Advent season is celebrated on Christmas Eve, the Christ candle is lighted, symbolizing the birth of Christ. And as I was preparing for our Christmas Eve season, I realized that I had never preached on a Christmas Eve service that Jesus Christ is indeed the light of the world. So I'd like to bring you a short message tonight that I've entitled, The Light of the World. If you have your Bible, and uh, if you don't, there'll be Bibles in front of you in the seats, please grab one and turn with me to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. I'd like to lay, lay before you six truths about Christ as the light of the world from John chapter 8, verse 12. John chapter 8, verse 12 reads as follows. Then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world and he who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. First point I'd like you to notice about Christ being the light of the world from this passage is that the light is Jesus Christ. In just a moment, we'll note the Greek rendering of I am, ego and me. But for now, it's important just to note that in Greek, that's emphatic. So the grammar, when something is emphatic in grammar, it, it helps us understand how it's to be heard orally. When Jesus said, I am, we would say in our vernacular, it would sound something like this. I, I am the light of the world. The I is emphatic. Now this whole statement is absolutely incredible when you understand the context in which Jesus said it. Jesus made this declaration at what is known as the Feast of Tabernacles or is sometimes called the Feast of Booths. This is one of the seven feasts that our Lord instructed the Jews to uh, uh, carry out seven times per year in the book of Leviticus. This was a seven-day feast, and it was given to the Jewish people to commemorate their wilderness wanderings, and specifically for them to remember that God himself is the one who provided for them and led them during the wilderness wanderings. Now, it's called the Feast of Booths because all of the Jews were required to build tents and live in them during this seven-day feast. So during this time of year in Jerusalem, there would be tents all around the Temple Mount on housetops and in the streets, and people would be occupying these booths, signaling their wilderness wanderings. Now during the Feast of Tabernacles, every night there was a temple lighting ceremony. And this temple lighting ceremony was done to symbolize God's guiding the Jewish people while they were wandering in the wilderness by a pillar of fire by night and a lighted cloud by day. We call this the Shekinah glory. It's a Hebrew rendering for the word glory. And the idea is that the Shekinah glory, this pillar of fire that led them by night, symbolized God's presence with them. Now what happened uh, every night during the seven night ceremony is that the Jewish people would fill what's called the court of the women with huge menorahs or lampstands with four branches of oil. And they were placed all through the court of the women. There were so many candelabras placed in the court of the women that the Jews actually called this the illumination of the temple. And you can imagine it in an agrarian society where uh, everything in our world is lit up at night. That wasn't the case in their world. But for seven days, it was actually six days, it started on the second day of the Feast of Tabernacles, they would jam the court of the women full of these candelabras, and there would be a team of priests whose job was to make sure that there was enough oil in the lamps to keep the light burning all night. And as the temple would then look like light was flooding all through Jerusalem during this feast. Here's a picture of a model of Herod's temple. This would have been the temple as it looked during Jesus' time. 
Jesus was probably, as he said these words in John chapter 8, verse 12, standing somewhere in the temple or nearby it. We're not really sure because we don't have full detail about where he was standing. But that really big open area that you see there is called the court of the Gentiles. This is about six to eight football fields in size and actuality. This is where Jesus braided a whip and drove out the money changers. That was a miracle, by the way, because he literally drove out people that were occupying at least six football fields. In the middle is the temple. And when you would go from the court of the Gentiles, it's called the court of the Gentiles because if you were not Jewish, you were allowed to be on that temple mount. But if you were a Jewish woman or a Jewish male, you were able to go into the next place, which is called the court of the women. The court of the women is this little area right here. And this court is where they would have given offerings if you were Jews. There would have been uh, several trumpet-like offering bins, we might call them. And this is where people would go to uh, do their weekly or yearly giving. Beyond that is the court of the men. And you could only go into there if you were a Jewish man. And that is where the sacrifices were conducted. And then you go into the building and that's the holy place and then the holy of holies. But I wanted to give you that visual of the court of the women because it was jam-packed with candelabras. So when Jesus says in John 8, 12, I, I am the light of the world. He says this during the Feast of Tabernacles and the backdrop would have been the light beaming from the temple symbolizing the Shekinah glory of God. Now, some ancient historians tell us, we don't know if this has actually happened, but some ancient historians said that every night, two Old Testament passages that call the Messiah, the light of the nations were recited. That's Isaiah 42, verse six, where we read, I am the Lord and I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. And I will appoint you as a covenant to the people as a light to the nations. In Isaiah 49, 6, we read, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore and preserve the ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, he didn't say this willy nilly. Jesus was a master at taking advantage of opportunities. And in this particular moment in Jewish history, they were worshiping Yahweh for guiding them in the wilderness. And as they were worshiping Yahweh for guiding them in the wilderness by his Shekinah glory, it's as if Jesus said, hey, 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 I'm the real light. All that light that you're shooting out from the court of the women. It's all about me. And that brings us to our second truth about this light. Not only is this light Jesus, but this light is also divine. Notice the text in verse 12. Jesus said again to them, I am. That phrase I am is ego and me. It's the Greek equivalent to what scholars call the Tetragrammaton. The Tetragrammaton is a title for God's covenant name. Now this title, Tetragrammaton, is used because we're not 100% certain of what God's covenant name actually is. Because Hebrew scribes saw or revered God's name so highly, they would, they would actually take a bath after every stroke of their pen. And throughout history, over time, the name of God was altered because the vowels were removed. And so because we weren't entirely sure, and we're still not entirely sure what the covenant name of God is, scholars call it the Tetragrammaton. But vowels have been reasserted into those, um, those letters, and that's where we get the names Yahweh or Jehovah. Both are possible renderings of the covenant name of God. But this word ego and me is the Greek translation of the covenant name of God that is used in the book of Exodus. Now the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament that was around during the time of Christ, 
would have been uh, the Bible that most synagogues would have read from. And so if they would have heard, not in Hebrew, but in Greek, Exodus 3, 13 and 14, when Moses went to the burning bush and God said to Moses, go and set my people free. And Moses said, well, who, who do I say sent me? Well, God then gave Moses his name. And he said this, and Moses said to God, behold, I am going to the sons of Israel and I will say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, what is his name? And we shall say to them, God said to Moses, I am who I am. Ego emi. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. You see, to the Jews of Jesus' day, this would have been a double divine statement of divinity. For him to stand up on the feast of booths and to say, I, I am. In their minds, he just used Yahweh's name and you did not do that to claim divinity for yourself if you were a Jewish person. And then he adds on top of ego emi, I am the light of the world. In case you missed it, I am claiming equality with Yahweh. Jesus is the light of the world. And the light of the world is divine. This brings us to our third observation from the text. Notice John chapter 8 verse 12. I am, stop right there. Notice the definite article, the. I am the light. There are not multiple lights in the world. There is one. Buddha is not light in the world. No Hindu God is light in the world. Muhammad is not light in the world. Allah is not the light of the world. No guru is the light of the world. Christ alone is is the light of the world. Enlightenment only comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Acts 4.12 says, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. The light is Christ. The light is divine. The light is exclusive And number four, the light is for all peoples. Notice the text. I am the light, notice the word, world. This is the Greek word that comes from the noun cosmos. Now this word cosmos is used by John in the gospel of John in 10 different ways. This is not what we would call a technical word. Technical words are words that have very precise meaning. This is a word with a broad meaning. And so the word world is uh, employed in a variety of ways. For example, sometimes in John, it refers to the entire universe. Sometimes it refers to the physical earth. Sometimes it refers to the world system. Sometimes it refers to all humanity minus believers. Other times it refers to a big group of people. Other times the elect only, sometimes the non-elect, Then it's used in John 1.10 to define the realm of mankind. Sometimes it's used to describe Jew and Gentiles, like in John 4 verse 42, or the general public in John 7 verse 4. When Jesus says here that I am the light of the world, he's using it to refer to all people. Now think with me for a second and imagine yourself there in this moment when Jesus claims to be the light of the world and you're Jewish. And you think that Yahweh only saves Jewish people. And you think it's blasphemy for anyone to claim to be Yahweh. And Jesus stands up and says, I'm Yahweh, I'm Yahweh, and I'm saving the whole world. That's why they wanted to kill him. He was saying things that did not compute to apostate Judaism. And this brings us to our fifth point, that the light is demanding. The light is demanding. Notice again in verse 12, 
I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness. To have the light of life or salvation or eternal life, you must follow Jesus Christ. The whole world does not have the light of Christ. Only those who follow Christ have the light of life. According to Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 38, there are three requirements that must be met to follow Jesus Christ. Let me read them to you. Mark 8, 34 says this, and he summoned the crowd of his disciples or with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Did you catch the word must? These are non-negotiable. See, there's a lot of nominal Christians out there today where people think that they're Christian because their parents are Christian or they came from a Christian family or because they live in a Christian nation. And so when they're asked, well, what religion are you? They'll say, well, I'm Christian, but they're not following Christ. You see, to follow Christ, Jesus says, he must He must what? First, deny himself. R.T. France writes this, self-denial, as Jesus teaches it here, is on a different level altogether than giving up chocolates for Lent. It is not the denial of something uh, uh, to the self, but it is a denial of the self. Sometimes when we think about self-denial, we think about not giving ourselves something that we want but that's not the Bible's idea of self-denial. The Bible's idea of self-denial is not denying yourself something you want, but it's actually you denying yourself. No self, no flesh. We follow Christ. It is a complete abandonment of your own thinking, your own wanting, your own amassing, your own idea of your future, your own picture of what your life is supposed to be like and saying, I take self and put it on a shelf and I follow Jesus Christ. You see, you cannot follow Christ if self determines how you live. You will be at conflict with yourself and Jesus It's either your will or it's his will. And at no time do they mix. You must abandon self-will and follow Christ. But to follow him, you must not only deny self, but he says in Mark 8.34, he said to them, if anyone comes after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross. Sometimes when we think of taking up our cross, we think, I... I got to wake up early and serve at church. That's taking up my cross. I got to go take a meal to someone who just got out of the hospital. That's taking up my cross. That's not taking up your cross. In the first century, a cross was the equivalent of what we would call today an electric chair or a lethal injection table. Do you know that a cross is a mode of execution? And so we're wearing crosses on our jewelry as a fashion statement But if you really want to send the message of what the cross means, start wearing an electric chair hung around your neck. When Jesus said to the people listening, there was no mistake about what he was saying. That in order to follow him and to have the light of life, you had to literally embrace your own death. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus says there are people that come to him and immediately receive the word of God with great joy. But when persecution and the cares of this world arise, they abandon Christ. And they become apostates because they are unwilling to follow Christ. Because listen, following Christ might mean for some of you that you're actually going to be martyred. Do you treasure Christ more than your own life? To follow Christ, you must deny self. You must 
Treasure him more than your own comfort. And you must completely submit to his will. That's what the word follow means. He's going one way and the world's going another. There are two roads that people are on. One is a narrow road that leads to a narrow gate and a narrow place. And the other is a broad road and there are many who are on it. And many enter through the broad gate and it leads to a broad place that is populated by millions upon billions of people and it's called hell. Jesus came down into the world to take upon himself the wrath that we deserve and we love him for it. We place our faith in Christ. We place our faith in the fact that Jesus died for my sin. Because what matters to me more than anything this temporal world can offer is my eternal soul. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? And so we follow Christ. We follow him joyfully. But he has placed his spirit within us. And his spirit is often in conflict with our flesh. The light is demanding. But last, the light is necessary. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, you cannot afford to leave this room without being a Christian. Now the words light and darkness are metaphors. The word darkness conveys the idea in the Bible of falsehood or impurity, sorrow, death and judgment. In John chapter eight, verse 12, when Jesus said, I am the light of the world and he who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. He's saying, you will not walk in falsehood. You will not walk in impurity. You will not walk in sorrow. You will not walk in death. You will not walk in judgment. As Paul says in Thessalonians, we are not destined to receive the wrath of God that is coming. The Bible describes every person who is not a Christian as being in the dark. Isaiah 5.20 says that woe to those who call evil good and good evil, listen to this, and who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness. That's what's happening in our world today. People are calling evil good and good evil. And what they're doing is they're substituting the darkness for the light. Ecclesiastes 2.14 says, the wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. 1 Peter 2.9 says, you are a chosen race, speaking of the church, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, listen to this, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The Bible goes on to tell us that all those who are in darkness are under the control of Satan. Acts 26, 17 and 18 says, I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness and light and from the dominion of Satan to God. The dominion of darkness is the dominion of Satan. That Greek conjunction chi, that word is translated into English and in that passage, makes those two statements inseparable. Darkness is the dominion of Satan. Second Corinthians four, three through four says, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not come to see the light of the gospel in the glory of Christ. Those who are in the dark are blind to the truth. And they walk aimlessly from sin to sin Willingly giving themselves over to every kind of impurity. Ephesians 4, 17 and 19 says, This I say, I affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. Listen to this. Being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God. Because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart, they have become callous, they have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Proverbs 4.19 says that the way of the wicked is like darkness. And Jesus says he's the light of the world. He's claiming that he alone is the light that is needed to find the way out of sin, death, ignorance, 
falsehood, impurity, sorrow, and divine judgment. And if you're here tonight and you're a Christian, I got great news for you. You are not in darkness because you are following the light of the world. He has given you a true view of reality. He has placed his spirit in you and led you out of sin. He has given you forgiveness and he has shown his face on you and his everlasting love. And you will never receive his judgment because of what Christ has done on your behalf. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, I have great news for you. You can become a Christian tonight. You can place your faith in Christ. Christmas is a celebration that the light has come into the world. Christ was born. But it's not about a baby in a manger. It's about a savior on a cross and the light that floods our lives and this dark world as the result of our savior's work. At this time, we are going to sing a carol and do a candle lighting. This symbolizes light going out into the world. Now listen carefully, I have instructions so that we don't burn the place down and we can all go to our Christmas Eve dinners. In just a moment, the ushers are going to turn the lights off. But I want you to understand the symbolic meaning of this moment. Earlier, Pastor Dave lit the Christ candle. The elders, two elders are going to come and they're going to light their candle with the Christ candle. And they're going to walk up every aisle and they're going to light the candle of the person at the aisle. And then the person at the aisle is going to lean over and uh, let that person light their candle from their candle. And it symbolizes the light starting with Christ, but now going out into the world. When Christ was among us, he was the light of the world. But after he left, he said that the church would be the light of the world. And we are a city on a hill. And he wants our light to so shine before men so that they will glorify God who is in heaven.